What we're going to do is in order to set up the kingdom of the Messiah, I believe that we have to understand a little bit more about what the Lord had to prepare in Satan's uh, divided kingdoms. So we're going to concentrate two main groups actually. So it's going to be a little bit of back to the past to solidify during what happened the BCs before Rome was able to conquer its full empire and growth and the Lord Jesus Christ was able to set in after the days of Julius Caesar. So let's look at these two powers, but let's review the beast. As I mentioned before, at Daniel chapter 7, verse 3 and 4 through 8, in our last discipleship videos about the four beasts, that this is not referring to Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. It accurately goes from Persia, then Greece, and then Rome, so over here would be, the lion would be Persia, the bear would be Greece, and then Rome would be the leopard. The fourth beast would be more accurately referring to the Antichrist beast. The reason why is because the ten horns matches exactly for the ten kings that would have happened according to Revelation chapter 17. Also out of this uh, fourth, this dreadful beast, the Bible says, it's going to have the Antichrist brought forth, born out of it. Another thing is this, is that uh, this is according to verse 1 during the time of Belshazzar. So if Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon and God was telling Daniel these four kingdoms shall arise in the future, it does not make sense that the first beast, the lion, would be Babylon then. Because if the first beast, the lion, was Babylon, that doesn't make sense because Daniel's already at the end of the Babylonian Empire at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. So in order to make a prof an accurate prophecy, obviously it would be Persia and then onward. Not only that, the fourth beast directly matches with the Antichrist all over the book of Revelation. So establishing that fact, we're going to look at these we looked a lot at this beast, the leopards, a lot. Now we're going to examine these two because these two are the ones that made, that paved the way where the Roman Empire was able to take over these two and establish the coming of the Messiah later on. And it changed all of history where Rome became an effect for the next 2,000 years after Christ. So we're going to study these two kingdoms even further, which is very interesting. You remember what happened to India, right? At India, it was the birthplace of two wicked religions that time, and those two wicked religions were the more popular one, Buddhism, and then the other one is Jainism. Buddhism, Jainism came from India. So the Eastern wicked religions, the mess up in Eastern culture came from this direction. But there is one group of people that you want to know. Genesis 10, remember God gave a promise to Japheth's seed that he shall be enlarged, if you remember in your discipleship videos. Now Satan, as I told you before, he attacked all three from Shem, Ham, and Japheth to accomplish his goals. Now this is how he used Japheth. He used Japheth where he was enlarging himself, and he knows that's God's, uh, God's promise to Japheth. So Satan says, okay, why don't I use that to my advantage where Japheth's seed will spread their mess? So you heard a little bit about this before. Now uh, we're going to look at Widowson's book on page 37. Uh, again, many times I mentioned that Widowson's book is highly recommended even though you don't have to have it. But in Widowson's book on page 37, he mentions over here that as we start the ancient India culture, let's go back to the past to see how Satan would establish an Eastern mess, okay? So let's look at this Eastern mess. One direction that would come from the East Let's first look at India. It was the Mohenjo-Daro culture that time, as you might recall, in our long time ago discipleship videos. It is very possible their empire was pre-flood. Remember Genesis chapter 6, there was great violence in the earth in those days, and the gods mingled with the humans. 
and then the accounts that would record ancient India culture would be the Hindu writings the Hindu writings so if you want to dig up everything about ancient India culture it'll be the Hindu writings and we'll cover a little bit more about them later but the ancient Hindu writings claim that there was uh, there were wars going on and there were even uh, possibly flying objects flying ships and then, as you might recall, Oppenheimer, if I recall the man's name, or one of the famous nuclear scientists, he mentioned that they weren't practically the first ones that set off the nuclear bomb, but that it could have been from India. It could have been from India, perhaps. So there was a huge warfare. The gods and Satan's culture was seeded in India. Today, we see the, uh, the apparent fruits of it through... The, literally thousands of gods if not millions of gods throughout India now Satan still had plans with India after the flood God wiped it all out gave it a clean slate so Satan would not let it go so then during the uh, now as we come to later dynasty periods remember that one group were the Dravidians now the Dravidians if you might recall they were the darker skin people that lived in this region but then there was a group which came from Japheth a lighter skinned people now with the mingling of Japheth and other uh, other cultures that time we see over here that they were the Aryans now you might recall that I mentioned briefly that the Aryans were the ones who later dominated the Dravidians in India and then it was during this Aryan culture that time that took it over which is very very interesting that you're going to find later on that there was a split now this split within the Aryan culture what you're going to notice is found at Esther chapter 1 verse 1 go to Esther chapter 1 verse 1 the only time you will ever see India mentioned in your Bible, the only time, is in the book of Esther. Esther is the only uh, book in the Bible that records about India. Esther 1.1. 1, 1. Now, who's in direct relationship with India? Esther chapter 1, verse 1. It shows over here that there was a split, if you look at gen uh, genetic charts today, modern day geneticists will mention that there were basically several migration waves but there was a split one where it went over here to India and the other one we see over here media Persia now you notice that they're right next to each other the only thing that would probably separate them would be this Indus River So, you'll notice that they're basically next door neighbors. If you, this follows logically through the migration route. You see that? If they come from over here and go this way. So, the Aryans were the ones that were responsible for building a lot of their eastern powerful culture that time. So Esther 1.1, 1, 1. notice, now it came to pass in the day of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned. Notice, so this is the Persian king, but it goes from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. So this is why India would be important in your Bible, only because of Persia, and Persia would only be the reason in your Bible because of the Jews, Israel. So Dr. Rutman mentioned in his Hebrew history class that all other nations, why aren't they recorded as much in the Bible? It's because God don't care about these nations. He doesn't care about their history. He doesn't care about Satan's civilization, Satan's culture. He only gives you a brief glimpse of that in relation to his own people. The only reason why these uh, pagan nations ever get a name in the Bible is because of the Jew. Yeah. It's because of his people. If it relates to his people, then he's going to mention them. Right, right. So that's the reason why, the only reason why he would mention them is this relationship of India with Media Persia. So let's look at that relationship then and how 
the Lord had to set things up for the Messiah later on because Satan was setting something up himself. Because the Aryan mixed, which were claimed to be lighter skinned people, would explain later on that you would know very infamously during the days of World War II, where Hitler wanted to make a purebred Aryan race. That, that racist, wicked thinking, they tried to dig up from these group of people a long time ago that time. Now let's see how the devil used these people that time with their culture. So then we're going to look at Widowson's book once more. And we're going to look at page, let's see over here, 43. We're going to look at page 43, if that is the right page. He says over here, it is in this general period of time that the Aryan migrations and invasions of Dravidian India are said to begin. The Dravidian are the non-Indo-European inhabitants of India who now occupy the southern portion and Sri Lanka, which formerly was known as Ceylon. The Aryan invaders were closely related to Persians or Iranians today with regard to language. Very little is known of the warfare between the invaders and the dark-skinned early inhabitants, but it was the synthesis of the Aryan and the Dravidian that produced the new what? Hindu civilization after 1400 BC, according to traditional historians. So Buddhism and Jainism, they were broken branches from a long time ago, if not the most ancient religion today. If not the most ancient religion today, or perhaps it is Hinduism. And it's because of the Aryans that they had a huge influence on that. So let's look at the culture of uh, Indian religion that time. At page 66 of Widowson's book, he mentions this. Nearly all of the information that modern scholars have about ancient India comes from the Vedas. The word Veda means knowledge. All right, so that's the key over here. That's the sacred text that would mention about ancient India culture and where Hindus revere the Vedas. Now remember, China had its own philosophical text through Confucius. So India, they had a religious text and they also have a more of a philosophical text, kind of like what the Chinese had. And this one would be known as the Upanishads, the Upanishads. Here we see philosophy and religion. And then this is how it goes. The word Veda means knowledge. The Vedas, though, are essentially collections of Hindu religion, religious writings. The Upanishads, on the other hand, are more philosophy and psychology. The word comes from Upa, which means near, and Shad to sit, as in sit near the teacher and learn. They consist of 108 discourses composed between 800 B.C. and 500 B.C. Uh, 500 BC. The number 108 becomes significant in an occultic way through Indian martial arts that come to China and eventually in Japan. Remember Alexander the Great who brought uh, the Greek pancration? So then India took uh, its own form and unique martial arts, which was greatly influenced from Alexander the Great. And then it hit to China, remember, which hit to Kung Fu and then Japan, which became karate. Now let's keep reading over here. The theme of the Upanishads on page 67 of Widowson's book is basically why are we here? One clear teaching of this religious expression is that the individual soul will eventually go back into the impersonal soul of the universe. There's your reincarnation. In other words, one thing you lose when you finally die in the long chain of reincarnation is your personal identity. On the other hand, the God of the Bible does not teach that you cease to become an individual when you die. The supreme God in this combination of religion and philosophy is Brahma the creator, followed, by, followed later by Vishnu the preserver and then by 
Shiva the destroyer. Now you notice over here that this combination of religion and philosophy had these three gods that they see as important for their life balance. Brahma as the creator, Vishnu preserver, Shiva the destroyer. And then you notice that they have their own trinity set up. Satan has his own trinity set up. The universe cannot exist without the, tri the trinity in Christian teaching. But the Hindus, they had that a long time ago as well. So you see Satan was setting things up. The Hindu religion and its offshoot Buddhism have permeated our Western culture much to the efforts of many celebrities from the American Standard Version Bible translator Philip Schaff to the American actor Richard Gere as well as the rock group The Beatles. I like this author. He just, he just uh, calls them all out, man. Just calls them all out. Some onliners might be in shock. They might go, how dare would he call out a nice, honest Christian? No, these modern Bible version translators, they are, uh, they are spawns of Satan to accomplish his goals. Amen. And when I say spawns of Satan, you know, I don't want people to get upset and think that I'm saying that they're going to hell. No, I'm just saying that they're pawns, basically, right. used by Satan to do his bidding. Didn't you know that you could be a saved child of God and Satan could use you to be his little pawn if you're not careful? Yeah. All right, but I'm not going to preach on that, okay? Now, let's look at Daniel chapter 8. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 8. And then we're going to look at verses 3 through 8. Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 through 8. Notice there are two kingdoms that the Lord has concentrated as he sees something very important that will make an impact later on for the coming of the Messiah. We see one from the east, all right? And that is referring to the goat uh, and the ram. Look at verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. So notice that there were two horns over here. Media Persia is represented as basically the ram with two horns over here. So then why is it two horns? Because it's Media Persia. Now, remember if you recall the previous discipleship videos over here, that Media and Persia were once separated kingdoms. And Persia, the reason why it became powerful was that it swallowed up Media. The Medes, remember, they were a powerful empire. So it's funny how the Persians were able to take it over and then conglomerate. But remember, the Medes were a powerful empire that, that gave a hard time to the most, uh, to the th three ancient superpowers during the long time ago BCs after Noah's flood. One of them was Assyria. See that? So the Medes were super powerful people. But then the Persians, they swallowed them up and it became Media Persia. They, they come from the Aryan group as well. Remember, I mentioned that there was a split over here. Yeah. So there was a split. So you see how East, Satan's eastern power was hitting over here, influencing Israel. But then you can't forget the other side over here. Verse 4, I saw the ram pushing where? Westward. Okay, so see he's going right here. He's going over here. Now let's keep reading. And northward and southward, so that, no one, uh, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. So he was going also uh, northward and southward as well. Which is why this kingdom was eventually to be reached. Verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from where? Now, Satan's other power, the West. And uh, which child of Noah's lineage did they come from? Japheth. See, Japheth shall be what? Enlarged. Cyrus and Alexander were the two conquerors responsible for spreading their empire. In fact, Alexander the Great's uh, hero was Cyrus, actually was Cyrus. So when Cyrus, uh, there was a story which is very interesting, but 
Supposedly, when Alexander the Great eventually took over Persia and reached Cyrus's tombstone, he blamed the people for not really taking good care of Cyrus's tomb, and then he started to build up his own. Uh, he started to upgrade Cyrus's tomb, so to speak. But these two, why? Because based on God's promise, Japheth shall be enlarged, but then Satan knows what God's word is prophesying and his promise goes. So what Satan does is that he goes with the flow. That's a key thing you want to know about history, is that Satan knows that he cannot go out of the bounds where God lays the bounds. So then he's going to use whatever he can to corrupt within the boundary lines that God moves. A great example is America. You see both sides so antagonistic where one is overtly patriotic because they see God's hand in it. And then the second side that sees nothing but evil and conspiratorial because they see the globalists involved in it. But the problem with two sides is they don't see this. God's promise and blessing was upon America because blessed is the nation that feareth the Lord, whose God is the Lord. So there was no doubt about that, the foundation of America. Satan sees that, so then he follows within the boundary line and sets in certain people undercover that influence politicians and early founding fathers later on. So that's a key thing you want to know about history. In this history class, you have to understand where, how the devil moves. So where God is growing in his work, you better be careful where Satan's going to follow along and try to use it to his advantage. If God blesses your work as a powerful minister, don't think that Satan's going to use that to his advantage and say, I'm going to use this Bible-believing preacher who's already well-known amongst people where God blessed him and turn it instead into a ruined testimony where he's caught with money, caught with sex, etc., and ruined the whole Bible-believing work. Now let that preach to you. I don't have time to preach, but history, the point of history class is to understand how the devil moves, how God moves, so your actions you got to realize, can be influenced by either two powers according to your free choice, whether you follow that flesh according the, to the devil's whim or to the spirit, how the Holy Spirit God guides you. Now let's, so then we see the Japheth seed shall be enlarged and they influence the lighter skinned people, Aryans, which uh, influence the Semitic cultures over here. And then we see over here, Japheth seed over here, where it uh, influences the Caucasian culture and then influences over here. There, these two powers collided where Israel is right smack dab in the middle, actually. And then Rome took the totality of both of this. You see that? Rome took the totality for both of this, and that's why the Lord Jesus Christ saw it fitting as the perfect time where they truly needed a Messiah. Because they already laid down a combination of all of Satan's systems over here. Satan's system that he tried to build so carefully from the east and then from the west. What was Satan's mess from the west? Because you got to understand, Greece is the birthplace of western civilization. You know where you get this stupid mess from, the American mess from? All of this was uh, the birthplace of western civilization, yeah. where you get the idea of philosophy and then the skeptical thinking, and then the idea of uh, mankind's own democratic setup and rationalism, etc. All from here, Greece. So then you have, these, uh, you have this uh, eastern mess and this western mess that was already dominating all of the um, main lines over here. Remember, India, if you recall in your last discipleship video, had elements of Greco and Persian uh, elements within their arts and architecture. So they were influenced up to here. So Rome, when, when Rome was like an iron, just hammering down all the powers, bashing them over here and bashing them over here, through, through its iron, remember that's what the Bible described it. As an iron, it just started banging, it started banging, and then it took the, the entire mess. Which is why the Roman Catholic Church inherited that mess. And then 2,000 years, Everything that you see of world empire or globalism, Roman Catholic Church inherits it. Yeah. Satan, he tried to build it up where it can conglomerate together. Why? Because the Tower of Babel did a really big job that the Lord did to try to split them all up. 
He says, no, you're going to spread throughout through all the world. Because I know what happens to mankind when they combine their cultures, they combine their beliefs together. Uh, because what happens? You get the mess today. That's what happens. So then, so God did a great job. And that Tower of Babel ruined for centuries, if not millennia, as you got to understand. So Satan had to work very hard where he was like thinking, okay, what is it within God's scriptures that I could probably use to build up something here? Well, he's promised he would enlarge Japheth, so I'm probably going to use them. So I'm going to have Japheth, where they enlarge themselves, that they're going to dwell in the tents of Shem. So then I'm going to use that where they're going from the east through the Aryans. And then Greece, later on, I'm going to build them up. Remember, that's where the Philistines came from. And the Philistines were probably the hardest group that the Jews ever fought for centuries, for centuries and centuries throughout their kingdom. They cover several books in your Bible, you understand, the Philistines. So these were, from west to east, Satan built up his power. So then what happened is that the west dominated. As you might, re as you might read over here at verse 5 and verse 6. He came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. There goes Alexander the Great with Greece. Fury of his power, what does he do? And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with color against him, and smote the ram, and break his two horns over here. Media Persia power gone. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-go waxed very great. And when he was strong, what happened? This great horn from the goat over here broke down. Why? When, after Alexander the Great died, what happened? The Diodaci came out. For it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven, the four powerful leaders who inherited Alexandria, Alexander the Great's great empire. They were also known as the Diodaci. So then these people, uh, so then this horn split into four. And they inherited this huge empire over here. But When they inherited this huge empire over here, you go further west, there's Italy, Rome. And Rome had the bigger chunk of the pie. But then, so then Satan, he had his perfect system set, set up, see? The Roman Empire. But then God sent down the Messiah, and instead of conquering that physical kingdom through physical means, he conquered that physical kingdom through spiritual means, right. through the kingdom of God. And so Satan realized that he was losing it. His physical kingdom was losing to the spiritual kingdom. So then, in, so then what did he do? He switched it to a spiritual kingdom, the Roman Catholic Church. And that spiritual empire continue on to this day as one of the most powerful systems in the world. Do you understand the spiritual play now a little bit when you look at history? Okay, now let's keep going, all right? Uh, we're going to see a few interesting things over here concerning about Persia's relationship with India. So we're going to look at further proofs of this. So you got to understand that the reason why that I combine this in this teaching from ancient India all the way to review to Persia is that in order to set up the where Jesus Christ came as the right Messiah at this conglomeration of Satan's empire, we have to go back to the origins how Satan set it up. So we're going back to how Satan set it up, and then that's why India is a very important nation for that one. So then, in order to see the relation, so then, why is India important? Because they are interrelated with the media Persians. So then let's look at some examples, which is why Hinduism is related, has a lot of interesting similar roots with, remember Persia's main religion that I taught you? It was Zoroastrianism. All right, now look at this. This is from the article of The Atlantic. The title of this article from The Atlantic is Who Are the Aryans? by John Fisk. Now let me read you some of the interesting things over here. As soon as I find the text. A comparison of the Zendavesta with the Veda, 
So that's the sacred text of those two religions, of the Persian religion and the India religion. So strongly alike as they are, both in thought and in expression, shows clearly that the occasion of this schism must have been the promulgation of the worship of Ahura Mazda. So that's the worship of the God, the key collective God. In illustration of this community of origin between the Vedic and Zendavestan peoples, let us refer to the name of the first country which the supreme deity created. The name of Aryana Vaejo. This, as already hinted, is not a geographical name. There is no identifiable locality which has ever been called Ar Aryana Vaejo. The name simply means uh, the name means simply the starting place of the Aryans. In later Persian mythology has represented in the Minoc Hyred. The name came to stand for a terrestrial paradise where men live for 300 years without pain or sickness, where no lies are told and where 10 men eat of one loaf and grow fat thereon. In the Vendidad, however, Aryana Vaejo is simply the primeval dwelling place, whatever it may have been, from which the Aryans passed into Sogdiana. Now, Aryan was the name by which the ancient Persians and the ancient Hindus alike described themselves. You got to understand that. Hindus called themselves Aryans, and the Persians also called themselves Aryans. Both religions recognize that. In the Vedic hymns, the dominant people of India habitually speak of themselves as Aryans, in contrast with the Dacias or inferior, inferior races of Hindustan, whom they had subdued. Just in the same way, Darius Histapses, uh, now Darius Histapses, you understand, is one of the famous Persian kings later on. In the inscription upon his tomb, declares himself to be an Aryan of Aryan descent. How about that? See, all of them declare to be Aryans. For some weird reason, why would they do it with pride? Why would they do that with pride? Because Satan was setting up something over here through these conquerors, through Japheth being enlarged. The Medes are all, always called Aryans by Armenian writers, and Herodotus... Remember that guy who I always quoted for ancient Greek history? Was also familiar with this appellation. In a more special sense, the countries between India and Persia, now known as Afghanistan and Kabul, were known throughout classic antiquity as Ariana. Along with this community of name, there was close community of speech among these peoples. The court language of the Medes and Persians, as preserved in the cuneiform inscriptions of Darius, the Zend or Bactrian language in which the sacred books of Zarathustra are written. Okay, so we get the, so we compare the Persian writings with and the Sanskrit of the Vedic hymns, the Hindu writings, if you, you look at their languages, are as clearly dialects of the same parental language as, believe it or not, French. Spanish and Italian are dialects of Latin. These outline facts are all that we need for the present to show how Aryan was a common name for a race which, advancing from the north, acquired supremacy over all the country between the Euphrates and the mouth of the Ganges. Wow. So Satan was setting these people up. He was setting these people up long at the BCs. While, while he was enlarging these Aryans, God made a promise. To Abraham, you're going to be enlarged, and your seed will multiply throughout all the world. There was competition. Always know this, Satan always tries to imitate God and will compete. All the way during the BCs. Sure as you live and breathe, man. And you thought that history was boring, right? Alright, let's look at page 66 over here. Widowson says something very interesting. The language of the Vedic period was Sanskrit, all right? So India here, the Hindus, which is labeled as one of the oldest of the Indo-European language group, such as the Aryans. 
Although Hebrew is older and is perhaps God's language. It is probably, this is interesting, you know what Widowson says, and I looked at other sources too. It is probably the mother tongue of all languages. Wow, Hebrew. Praise the Lord. Well, no, actually not Hebrew. It's uh, Sanskrit I'm oh, talking Sanskrit. about. Okay. Sanskrit, Sanskrit wow. actually. So you see over here, Satan was already laying, competing with his own yeah. universal language. Greek was already, through Satan's power, becoming a universal language over there. Wow. So then God's like, okay, then Satan, then I'm going to use what you're doing. So then he used it for the New Testament today. So then Satan don't like that, so then he used his other wicked power, Rome. We're going to do Latin, you know. And that didn't work. Wow. And then God switched from Greek to English. So we have our English King James Bible, and Satan's like, okay, let's go back to Greek over here. Yeah. And you got today's bald-headed scholars today. Yeah. You see that? Watch. You, they don't know. If you are familiar with your history, you'll know the spiritual workings, and you'll know why we're a Bible believer, believing what we believe today. There's a reason why we teach and believe this way in all of our doctrines. It relates to our history. Sanskrit. Greek, Latin, and English all have some similarities in numerals and family terms. Isn't that interesting? For instance, English 1, 2, 3, 4, and Sanskrit, ek, dui, tri, chatur, sound similar as do words for mother and father. The Sanskrit of the Vedas appears to be a scholarly tongue used only by scholars and priests. Oh, I wonder who, whose system does that. That's Satan's system. Yeah. That's the Roman Catholic Church with their priests. Ancient India religion with their caste system. The Hindu priests and those people are revered as the highest or one of the highest in the caste system. Today, your stupid Calvinists, your stupid Calvinists, your stupid non-denominationals, your stupid evangelical Christians who's, who have this elitist attitude about Hebrew and Greek, Hebrew and Greek. So you don't know how to interpret the Bible unless you know Hebrew and Greek like I do. Did you have degrees like I do? That's why I like to rub it in their faces like, what university did you graduate from? So that's why I compete with them. Yeah. Amen. Bunch of wicked people. And then these Calvinist crybabies, yeah, you're trolling me right now, you bunch of wicked people, saying, you know, oh, you know, it's not about universities. I don't know why you kick people about their universities. You stinking liar. You yeah. wicked people. Yeah. You brag about and boast your Greek and Hebrew knowledge with your yeah. seminary degrees when any flunky in my church can probably enter that seminary. Yeah. Uh, all right. And a bunch of wicked people. Oh, well, I got to continue on. Otherwise, I'm not going to reach here, right? Okay. All right, let's do this, okay? The word means uh, prepared, pure, perfect, and sacred. Huh. Vedic script is still pictographic. And it isn't until the 8th or 9th century that merchants bring actual Semitic writing from the area of Israel that the Brahma script came to be developed. Because remember in your earlier discipleship videos, Israel, if it is the most ancient language, they didn't use pictographs because they took seriously about worshiping graven images. So then they did this writing form. So then eventually India was influenced by that. Wow. Uh, actual Semitic writing from the area of Israel that the Brahma script came to be developed as did all of the later alphabets of India. For centuries, writing was confined to commercial and administrative purposes. Merchants, not priests, developed the art of writing in early India. Even the Buddhist canon does not appear to have been written before the 3rd century BC. The oldest inscriptions known were thought to have been done at the time of Ashoka, the Indian religious teacher of the 200s BC. All right, so remember Ashoka I talked to you about in our previous discipleship video where he went to Ashoka's hell and then he became, uh, I think he was known as the philosopher king and then he uh, amended a lot of his ways. Now, this is what you got to understand about the India culture as a result. So because of this dark eastern influence, this is the result. In India, the formation of the Vedas takes place between 1000 BC and 500 BC. 
The Upanishads are written between 800 and 500 BC. The kings of the Vedic period of India often raided their neighbors for cattle and like Ethiopia today, marriage was often the result of forcible abduction of the bride or her purchase by mutual consent. Marriage by mutual consent was thought, however, to be less honorable and more of a compliment if the bride were stolen or purchased. The Rig Veda, the Rig Veda, the Rig Veda speaks of all of the perversions we encounter today. Incest, seduction, prostitution, abortion, and adultery. But in general, there is a high moral standard between the sexes and the family is very important. Women enjoyed far greater freedom in India during this period than in later times. Women could appear freely at feasts and participate in religious sacrifices. If she was a widow, there were no restrictions on her remarriage. She could study and engage in philosophic disputation like the famous philosopher and composer of hymns, Gargi. Other female philosophers and hymn composers of the time were Maitreyi, Lapatmudra, and Gosha. Vedic Indians bartered and ate cows unlike today. All right, you know what, what they do with cows today, right? It, it's a sacred reincarnation, so let's leave that cow alone, all right? Why? Because that mess wasn't building up more and more, where Jainism, Buddhism, and a lot of other Eastern influence was building up more and more. So they weren't there yet. Romans 2, their conscience was still kicking in that time. They had at least some sort of moral, as you can tell from the writings. Despite of the greatness of sin and laughter that you, uh, uh, ludicrous things that you read out of over here, you also see some of the things that their conscience allowed them to do, that God instilled in them. Uh, let's see over here. They planted barley, but knew nothing or rice, it would seem, at that time. There were no banks or alewives, as in Assyria, to lend money. Whatever you had was hid in your own home. Money itself was a late development, as bartering in cows and goods was the original means of exchange. Later, during the age of Buddha, credit developed. The Aryan invaders displaced the religion of the earlier residents, the Dravidians, see? So it's because of these Ar Aryans, that's why a lot of this mess was able to come out which is still found in places much like the Aryans found among the Nagas. Animistic worship with totems and symbols much like parts of Africa today. Serpents and dragons were divinity and we can make the connection safely with Satan's religion spreading around the earth. So you see all this? Where were they carrying these Aryans? All the way back to what? The Tower of Babel, Semrod and, uh, Semiramis and Nimrod's religion. See? Yeah, so... Just misquoted, uh, just mispronounced right over there. All right, let's read back over here. Hanuman, the monkey god, is still worshipped, as in Nandi, the bull god. The earliest gods of the Vedic period were forces of nature, such as sky, sun, earth, fire, light, water, and sex, all good and evil spirits. We have the Atharva Veda, or Book of the Knowledge of Magic. One must recite spells to obtain children, to avoid abortion, to prolong life. So they had this book of the knowledge of magic that they would do to just recite spells to obtain children, avoid abortion, to prolong life, to ward off evil, to go to sleep, and to destroy enemies. In the Briha Darayanka, Upanishad formulas were given for forcibly seducing a woman by incantation. They remind one of the emerald tablet written by the Egyptian magician priests. Many of the Indian gods we know of today were like the gods, guess what? The East, the gods of India were very much like the gods of Greece, West. See, Satan was conglomerating over here. Local gods who had not assumed their all-important universal power, such as Krishna, whom George Harrison of Beatles fame created a famous hymn to called My Sweet Lord, which, unfor which unfortunately many young Christians who didn't listen to the lyrics carefully enough were deceived by. Wow. Alrighty then, so this is what we see with the history of ancient India and then Greece where it was being influenced. Now ancient Greece, a uh, fresh review of some of the things, you might recall that with the Mycenaean civilization, 
that that's where a lot of we hear about the gods and the heroes. And during that time, just like all other pagan nations, we can't really tell much from fact from fiction over there. So then we hear about um, Odysseus, we hear about Helen of Troy, we hear about Achilles, and then uh, we hear about the tragedy at Troy. We don't know how much is true or false. Some of it is interesting, though, about some of the historical accounts or different nations who accounted these people. Uh, Helen of Troy, for example, this was, uh, I have an interesting teaching that, Lord willing, we will do at the Women's Jubilee, where I would talk about the uh, history of Jezebel. So we're going to going to cover Helen of Troy, Cleopatra, Jezebel, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's, a long, that's way ahead in the future, okay? Way ahead in the future. I'll talk about that later. So I'll talk about that later. But uh, a lot of interesting things of Helen of Troy, but I can't say in this teaching. I'll say that for the Women's Jubilee one day at the spring. Okay, but the thing is over here is that a lot of interesting historical accounts and then later on we see that there, when the Grecian Empire took over these stupid philosophers and their Western civilization, their democratic setup, rational, skeptical thinking, etc., etc., all started to uh, come into place. Their higher education, mathematics, etc. But they had the gods that Semiramis did. So let's review something here. Okay. All the way back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, Satan was already ruling all over the world. The gods intermingled with the humans. Violence, everyone didn't care for each other. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. All right? And then God just drowned it all out and started something fresh. So Satan tried to uh, start it again with conglomerating all of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth together at Tower of Babel. Yeah. God did a... Man, you got to have a brilliant God. It has to take a brilliant God to say, why don't I give them different languages? Yeah. No one would have thought of an idea like yeah. that. So instead of drowning them out, you know, because I promised I wouldn't kill them, I'll just mess up their speech. And then because of that, they can't get together. They're forced to separate from each other. So then what happens is this set off centuries, if not millennia, of Satan's plan. But Satan, he had this plan that I'm going to use religion of Nimrod. So all these people, they carry Nimrod's religion. And it was Nimrod's religion that was able to form some form of unity. But that was only on a religious plane. Satan had to eventually, from religion, influence political and societal plans, where it has to take over the world now. But how can he do it? How he did it was through using Japheth. And through Japheth being enlarged over here, he had the Aryans, where they came from east, and then the Grecians, where they came from west, bang, like that. And then the Roman Catholic Empire was, a grand, was the mother of all harlots, just took it all together and took the title proudly of mother of harlots and abominations. You see that? Yeah. Why? Because it is ancient Babylonian religion, Rome, all the way from Nimrod and Semiramis, all the way back there. That spirit continued. I have to end it. I can't go to Daniel 11. So, because there is so much over here, what I decided to do is this, okay? This, this is going to be fun, okay? So what I decided to do is that because there is so much important information, I'm going to close off this discipleship and then put like a, a extra small minuscule discipleship to continue the lesson, all right?